Good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Black History Month or a Black History Month event a panel on the very popular and Oscar nominated Steven Spielberg film Lincoln. Uh, since today is Lincoln's birthday, we thought it would really sort of be fitting to spend a little bit of time not only talking about the movie itself, right, but also think about the historical accuracy of the film um, and try to make some sense of that. Um, as we think about Abraham Lincoln, he has become, after his assassination in 1865, an American hero and a cultural icon. We think of Lincoln as the president who freed the slaves, who saved the Union, and for the most part, I think Steven Spielberg's film has done that. Uh, sort of reinforce a number of myths about Lincoln. Today, our panelists have graciously agreed to think about different aspects of the film. Uh, so what we will do is we will talk shortly. Each of us will have a brief speech or examination of a different aspect of the film. Let me introduce our panelists first, though. Uh, we have, I'm sorry, Patrick Bethel, uh, a history major and a junior. junior. And uh, Patrick is going to go ahead and look at Lincoln as a martyr, excuse me. We're kind of trying to make sure we try not to overlap too much. Um, next will be Erin Pence, and she is the president of the History Club. And so if you're interested in the History Club, this is a woman to come and talk to. She's also a history major and is a sophomore. Erin is, is going to um, talk about the lack of, of the of black presence in a film that is about the passage of the 13th Amendment, the abolishment of slavery. Um, to my right is Anthony Trombetta, and he is um, he is also a history major, John Jr. Although I wonder if he, at some point, is going to change his mind and become a film major when that becomes available. Uh, he is spellbound by Spielberg's beautifully made film. And he's really going to talk about the idea of uh, the filmmaker as historian and storyteller. Um, and then finally, we are, we've been blessed with the presence of Steve Thomas from the English department. And so when I asked Steve to kind of tell me what his, his brief talk was going to be about, um, I kind of came away with this, I could be wrong, I don't know, so Steve, forgive me. Um, how the plot of the story uh, contains a social and cultural action. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, so in an effort to try to squeeze as, as much in as we can, we will start with Patrick. All right, so I'm going to be talking about Lincoln as a martyr and how um, that has how that has impacted how he is shown in American popular life and how it was shown in the film. So, in his, the, the man Abraham Lincoln and the myth Abraham Lincoln really don't have all that much to do with one another. As a man, Lincoln was a pragmatist and a, a realist. He disliked slavery, he thought it should end, but he was also a man of laws who realized that he could not, upon his election, get rid of slavery wherever it was. And he felt, as president, that it was his goal to make sure that the Union survived. That was his goal above all else. But that doesn't fit what we want from Lincoln. We want Lincoln to be almost a god. <coughs> we want our founding fathers, Washington and Lincoln and all the rest, to be better than men. We want them to have been born and grown up and died with the values that we cherish in them. So we want Lincoln to have hated slavery, to have always hated slavery and to have done everything in his life, to have bent his entire life towards the eradication of slavery. And the movie backs that up. The movie shows Lincoln clothed in the power of the presidency, personally getting this amendment passed through any means fair or foul or in between. Because if we showed a movie about how Lincoln 
was influenced by others to pass the amendment, how Congress worked to pass the amendment, it wouldn't fit the narrative that we like. And ultimately, Lincoln is a martyr because of his, the way he died. He was re-elected, he oversaw the end of the war, and then in the moment of his greatest triumph, he was killed. And then his legacy was taken by his party to enact an agenda that in many ways he may have not wanted. But because of how he died, struck down at the moment of his glory, he became more than just a president. He became a symbol of the era. He became a symbol of our victory. And ultimately, if you look at the movie Lincoln, it does a much better job than most portrayals of Lincoln to show the complexity of him. It shows that he didn't just convince opponents of the amendment to vote for it through sheer force of his personality or because of his rhetoric or because of his morality. So at the very least, it shows that he had to get down and dirty like regular men to get things done. But it still shows this idealized portrayal of him. Because ultimately, we don't want to see Lincoln the way we see ourselves. We want to see in Lincoln the better angels of our nature. Okay, so I'm talking about how there's a lack of black appearance throughout the film. And I'm going to give you, for people that didn't see it, I'll give you an example of a scene. So, in the one scene, there was two black soldiers speaking with President Lincoln about the problem of unequal promotions in the Union Army. And at that point, they were, that was, they were the only ones in the entire scene. And then two white soldiers came up and joined in the conversation, but then the scene just ended. So you could say, from a standpoint, that the black appearance throughout the film was more passive. So, the movie devoted to explaining the abolition of slavery in the United States and the characters who represent the African Americans at the time do nothing during the film. As I said before, more in a present, uh, passive light. And they offered little to the movie, even though it was focused on the African Americans in regard to the 13th Amendment allowing slavery to be abolished. Um, first, let me start off by saying when I was about six years old, I saw uh, Jurassic Park and E.T. back to back, and it got me into wanting to be a filmmaker. And I'm hoping that even though I'm a history major, maybe I could do my senior thesis as a film instead of a 30 or 40 page paper. Maybe we'll see how that goes. Uh, my, my, main, my main focus was, wasn't the story, historical inaccuracies. Um, I look at the aesthetics of the film, how it was made, how it was acted in. Uh, for instance, the original script was 800 pages long, and I'm, and I'm sure it, it had more involvement with, uh, with Africans American. I'm sure it had more involvement in, in different scenarios, uh, but it was, you can't make an 800 page script in Hollywood, not even Steven Spielberg who made it. Um, <laughs> and also, uh, some of the things, some of the facts about it, uh, Spielberg came to work every day in a suit and tie. Um, he called Daniel Day-Lewis Mr. President on set. Um, sound artist went to, I, I forget where the museum is, but they have a working clock, uh, working, um, what are those clocks called? Like a, you know, like stopwatch? Yeah, like a stopwatch or something. They actually recorded the inside of his stopwatch for the movie to be used. I think stuff like that should be, should be realized that, you know, he's, he's an incredible storyteller. I don't think anybody else could tell a story so big, uh, even if it's just about a, a one important event. But I think it's important to realize that his storytelling and, and even the actors that he chose, he didn't choose Daniel Day-Lewis because uh, he, he could have probably chose anybody. Liam Neeson wanted to do it. There were a lot of people that were rumored to do it. But uh, he knows that Daniel Day-Lewis is dedicated to his art. He, he almost went crazy doing less than Mohegan's. Uh, he, he's done, he prepares for his role two years in advance. And he picks these actors and, and these screenwriters, like a Tony Kushner, to write his script and, and, and the people that he surrounds himself with to make a project that he feels passionate about. And I think you can, uh, Professor Reynolds was, was talking earlier to, to my class about how maybe the film had a little bit of tunnel vision. And it, it, it may, it, it, there might be a tunnel vision there, but 
and, it, and yeah, it's two hours and 15 minutes long, so maybe you should uh, get a little bit more, uh, maybe there is room to talk about a little more things, but I think his, his tunnel vision is, is, a right, is the right passage, and I think, uh, I, I didn't, as far as the historical inaccuracies, I, I know there are people, there, you can't, you can see this movie as a historical biography, or you can see it as everybody else as, that wants to get entertained by the film as a historical drama. And drama is not, is not history, drama is not facts. I hope you'll excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. Um, I brought a, a book just to pick up on something that Aaron said about the lack of black presence, and I think um, one, a figure that a lot of people have talked about is the fact that Frederick Douglass, um, one of the great abolitionists, does not show up in this film at all, even though he did have conversations with Lincoln. Um, since I know that, I, when I've mentioned this before to people, they said, well, you know, uh, Spielberg based it on this book, Team of Rivals. So over the weekend, I went and got t Team of Rivals to prepare for this. Yeah, kind of, I prepared um, for this. I read the whole thing. No, I didn't. Because um, it's like a million pages long. But I wanna, I'm just going to read the very first, first sentence in the book. Because some people say, oh, well, he's basing it on this book, so don't blame him if he doesn't include the things that you like, Steve. Um, first sentence of the book. In 1876, the celebrated orator, Frederick Douglass, dedicated a monument in Washington, D.C., erected by black Americans to honor Abraham Lincoln. The former slave told his audience that, quote, there is, a little, there is little necessity on this occasion to speak at length and critically of this great and good man and of his high mission in the world. That ground has been fully occupied. The whole field of facts and fancy has been gleaned and garnered. Any man can say things that are true of Abraham Lincoln, but no man can say anything that is new of Abraham Lincoln. So I thought I'd start with this quote by Frederick Douglass um, celebrating Abraham Lincoln. And of course, um, when you look, when you read through this book, you'll see there's a lot of things that were important for um, the abolition of slavery and the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, notably, for example, that the, the bill um, that was brought forward to Congress was brought forward by white feminist Katie Stanton um, and Susan B. Anthony. Um, and it's well known that the white feminist, white feminist um, were very much allied with abolitionists. And, the, and that those came together. So um, the question, though, I really want to raise, though, because I want to kind of dovetail with what um, Anthony, right? Anthony's talking about is the aesthetics, because I'm not a historian. I'm a literature professor. Um, so how does the story, how does the aesthetics um, deal with the complex plot? Because because as he's pointed out, it's a two and a half hour movie. You can't fit you know, a thousand page book to a two, a two hour movie. But it's interesting to look at the changes and the occlusions and how things are managed in the story, and I'll give you one kind of really bizarre example um, that I was talking with Anna Hurley about this morning. Um, that in the movie, Connecticut votes no, but actually Connecticut voted yes. Now, why change this? You know, so we're talking about why we like movies, right? Why? Because it's a drama; it's not a documentary. Why do we gain pleasure with this? And if you look at the drama of it, well, because he's because from a you know a literary perspective. He's building tension because Connecticut, this is Anne's, I'm just quoting Anne here. Cause, <laughs> this cause, whole cage rests on my word. I'm because, about that. Because Connecticut's a C, so it begins at the beginning of the alphabet, so they have to build tension. So you have all these no, 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 and you get really freaked out. Of course, you know the answer, but you still kind of like, and then in the end, it's yes, 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 right? So Spielberg is manipulating these facts to build dramatic tension and get you into into the story, which I think is great because it is a drama, but it still begs the question of why we enjoy historical dramas in the first place. You know, and, and there's been a lot of things in the news, for example, some people say, well, it's educational, we can teach this in high schools, but I don't think Spielberg was really making this movie for high schools. Um, but the movie does begin with two char with characters basically reciting the Gettysburg Address 
the very first scene in the movie is you feel like you're a high school student. That's how the movie begins with people trying to recite the Gettysburg Dress. And of course, the white character fails to do it, and the black character gets it right. We're all supposed to feel happy about that. Um, but the way this movie's been marshaled politically in Washington, D.C., is, is as a historical allegory for what Obama and Congress should do now. And that's been used, on the one hand, people are saying Obama should be more like Lincoln, i.e. ruthless and practical and like not wavering at all. And other people saying, oh no, this movie shows you that you should shift to the center and not be like Thaddeus Stevens. So there's all sorts of ways people read history as an allegory for the present. Um, other people just read it as patriot, patriotic. Um, and the reason why I raise these questions is because if you admit that this is a drama that's going to change facts or leave things out in order to present a very kind of, a very specific, pleasurable image of who we are as Americans, um, then the way he manages the plot um, means something. So it's like the way he's telling the story does it, isn't neutral, it means something. And that's what I want to talk about. And I actually think what this plot means is very dangerous. I'm very, I don't like the movie at all, so I'm going to talk about why I think that's dangerous. So, first of all, what's left out? All right. <laughs> um, I'm going to skip very ahead. The Douglas and the abolitionists are messed, left out, the feminists are mef, left out. The fact that Lincoln changed his mind, because he used to be for separatism, and then he changed his mind to be integrationist. The fact that he actually was a character who could change his mind is left out, because in the film he never changes his mind at all. Um, and that's important because it presents Lincoln as this heroic man who s s stood by and never, never changed, and that's what we're supposed to admire. Um, but in fact, that's not how it happened. Now, the plot actually contains all the radical movements in a very kind of creepy way. Two characters, only two black characters in the film that get any play, or actually there's only one, is Elizabeth Keckley, who is Mary Todd Lincoln's dressmaker. Now, she is a real person. Um, and in real life, she was an activist. In the film, she's just a dressmaker who hangs out with the wife. Um, Thaddeus Stevens' partner, another black woman in the play, Lydia Hamilton Smith, also in real life an activist, but in the film, just a domestic partner. Now, the, all the kind of depth and nuance that we get of Lincoln are basically home situations. Okay, so I just want to kind of show you how the plot is working here. Radical social activism in real history is displaced onto domestic life. All the conversations that might have been between actual activists and President Lincoln, like Frederick Douglass and President Lincoln, are shifted from a political sphere to a domestic sphere. They're contained. That's what I mean by contained social action. So any kind of sense of social action or activism as being a positive force, any kind of sense of the way cultural works, the way the broad culture works to um, affect cultural change is suppressed and basically moved into these little domestic situations. Meanwhile, Lincoln is doing this cool, pragmatic, um, behind-the-scenes dealings, and he's manipulating the congressman, he's doing stuff like that. So what you get at the end of the day is this, and I'm, and I'm rushing through a lot of stuff. I have a longer version online, but um, the image of America that the movie presents, the heroic America that Lincoln represents in this film, is an image of a somewhat ruthless, unwavering, but folksy and, cute and adorable Lincoln. Any kind activist, the only activist, the only time an activist does anything good is when he shifts to the center. Um, and what the movie leaves out is the kind of positive sense of culture, the solidarity, the way human beings work together um, for years and years and years to get things done, not in a ruthless way, but in a way that's more loving and caring for each other. I know that sounds a little hippy-dippy, but I'm going to quote, I'm going to finish by quoting Lincoln. Because um, in the movie, you get a sense that Lincoln is always in control. Um, And that this, and you never see the social activists that actually made things happen, like feminists and the abolitionists. But here's Lincoln in, 19, in 1864, um, and he's referring to 
people like Douglas. He's talking to Negro soldiers in the Union Army. Quote, I claim not to have controlled events, but confess plainly that events have controlled me. And I think I like Lincoln for doing that, you know, for saying like, yes, I am an effect of social activism of the abolitionists and all the other people that are involved and the positive culture that's going on here. Rather than the Lincoln and Spielberg's film, which is this guy who seems to be manipulating things like a puppet master. So, sorry I was rushing. <laughs> Thank you, Steve, but you still have 30 seconds. <laughs> oh, okay, so. <laughs> I'd like to take this opportunity just to add a few historical thoughts um, to the, to the, um, the film itself. And um, I think that the points that are made, uh, Patrick and Aaron, uh, and Anthony and, and uh, Steve, uh, are, are well taken. Uh, from a historical point of view, I think that we as historians, because certainly this idea that we go to a film such as Lincoln without any kind of historical knowledge is, it would, would be <coughs> inaccurate. But when we go there, we have a sort of series of ideas that we, we, we enter the movie theater with. Certainly, Lincoln as a natural, national icon, an American hero. Um, but Spielberg is, is really not a historian. Um, I would agree with Anthony in that he really is a storyteller. Regardless of what facts have to be omitted, his purpose is to present, I think, recreate uh, an image of Lincoln that is largely myth. This idea of a commander-in-chief who really did control the events of not just abolition, but of the Civil War itself. So some of the thoughts that I have about uh, the Lincoln film is this, this question of the responsibility of the filmmaker. Is Spielberg, are we requiring him to be historically accurate if in fact his film isn't so much about history but more about entertainment? <coughs> and in fact we, we don't hold him to that, right? But as a historian I think he really should have a higher standard in an effort to show a more complex Lincoln. Now, after answering that question, the next question that I would ask is, who is his audience? His audience is not a bunch of northerners, right, who are uh, rooting for the Union side, but rather a united country, right, where the South still sees itself as the kind of wrong party during the Civil War. And so if you notice in the film, Lincoln, there really isn't a good guy versus a bad guy. There is no right side versus a wrong side. Lincoln is doing what he needs to do because slavery is an evil. In the end, everyone will agree that he's done the right thing. And I thought that that was very interesting to sort of take the story of the Civil War and the passing of the 13th Amendment and take it out of historical context to make it seem like the Civil War was not as severe as it was. In fact, over 600,000 Americans died in that conflict more than any of the other conflicts wars that we had. Um, I think that sort of this idea, and I agree with, with Steve in this notion of a kind of folksy, hicky Lincoln really does take away from the brilliance of the man who knew that it would be better for him not to acknowledge Southerners as a distinct and separate country but rather to see them as states in rebellion, which would allow him to keep his presidential powers and do things that he wouldn't ordinarily be able to do. Um, and I thought that that was one of the weaknesses of the film. If he was really trying to show the strengths of Lincoln, I think that he really should have gave it a bit of depth uh, in terms of, of that. Um, um, those are just some of my thoughts. I personally agree with Anthony in that as a story that is being told to Americans, it was beautifully done. It was something that really was entertaining. But I think that if, in fact, someone came from another country who had no knowledge of American history, they would really kind of leave this film scratching their heads. Well, what is slavery? He doesn't define what slavery was, right? 
did Lincoln have help? Who were the abolitionists? Were there abolitionists in the North? How about <coughs> Northern public opinion? I mean, where was that? Lincoln really followed. He didn't lead in so many respects. He followed what public opinion was. Um, and so I think that that is one of the key witnesses of Steven, Steven Spielberg's film, this idea that Lincoln was this person who was uh, determined independently of what was going on around him. So we're going to take a few minutes and ask for questions from the audience. Um, take this out. Are there questions? If anybody has questions, just... Uh... Well, I'm just wondering whether, um, for whatever um, ideological or economic reasons, maybe Spielberg too was trying not to offend the South. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody want to answer? Yes. Since you know about, you feel about it. Um. On the spot with that question, um, I, I don't know. I, I think he. I think there's. He has to capture the broad audience. He has to capture America as 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 a whole. And um, what you were saying earlier in class is, is you know there's maybe maybe you don't want to offend this out. I mean I, I I know I I know from a film perspective that it might not be that that there's a lot of. Uh, Money that's that's geared towards uh, production companies from from the, that are in the South right now. A lot of money goes towards goes towards. So Georgia has a thriving market in film, and, and they're starting to be put on the map. Uh, so I don't know. I think he I think he I think he just tried to. I think he stayed away from the bad for the for the good. I think that's what he did there. Michelle, what a, a emotion came out of Academy. The pictures. They got the award. No, sorry, first we can't hear you there because you have. What's the I think, you know, I don't know if he's not trying to offend the South as much as he's trying to get nominated for Academy Awards. Because we will see when he did the Schindler's List, he had the slew of Academy Award nominations. When he had the color purple, he had zero. So I think he had, he was very smart at saying, I want to pick the film, I want to do it in a way that's going to be entertaining, but also not offensive to those folks who are going to reward me. And we see now he's got a slew of Academy Award nominations on a film that, as Dr. Reynolds said, is really around this issue of slavery, but he only cast it two really important voices that he didn't give a voice to. So I think he's really looking at, you know, how can I make sure I get the Academy Award nominations and hopefully an Academy Award out of it. So that's my opinion. That. Ironically, he offended Connecticut. <laughs> 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 but, uh, no, but I think, and I think you're, and I think you're right that like, it's, and it's not only the South that he had to worry about defending, because as Rita pointed out, um, when you're looking at this movie, you see the politicians acting but you never know what the stakes are or what, what's motivating any of them and why they care about any of the positions they're taking. Um, and this isn't just the South. I think this is also the North, because it's not like the North was pure and good. I mean, the North was had bankers who wanted to buy the South. They wanted to exploit um, industrial scale labor. Um, they had very, I don't know, not so nice motives for emancipating the slaves. Um, and this is and so he's not going to include that. He kind of gestures at that briefly, which I actually, I actually do want to give him credit for like having characters who do represent that faction. But um, he has them, strangely enough, voting against the abolition of slavery when they would actually have been for it. So, um, so he's actually totally reversed, and not for like nice reasons. Um, but so he doesn't want to offend a lot of people. And just going off pleasing the Academy, he leads the pack with 12 nominations this year. <laughs> Jank is better. <laughs> well, but I, I think that the, the part of what Spielberg is doing is is is, um, is creating a kind of um, uh, creating a new history. I mean, revisionist history in the worst kind of way, right? Um, because the Academy is not going to go ahead and nominate and give him an Academy Award if he. If he's alienated, you know, half of the population, you know, um, so I think that he really does have to kind of ride a middle ground, right, as a as human as well. I mean, can you think of any films that are really critical, 
right, of this, except for maybe Schindler's List, you know, where he has permission to do that. And it, he would actually be criticized if he didn't do that, right? Um, I mean, I, I would have preferred um, a film on Lincoln that was more like a Schindler's List, where he really yeah. took the South to task, um, or even Northerners for not, you know, sort of coming out in force behind the abolition of slavery. Uh, any other questions? Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering, uh, which scene for you was like historically the most accurate and it is your favorite scene? Okay, so I, I would have to argue that probably, I can't answer that question because all the dialogue is created. Yeah. Right, it's all fiction. I mean, it's based on some kind of historical truth, but it's historical fiction. Um, I thought that they were all emotionally moving. I mean, who knows what that is Stephen said to his common-law wife when he went home, right? I don't, I don't know. I mean, those kinds of questions I can't answer. But I think that, um, I think that the idea that, that Lincoln was passionate, at least, you know, to recognize the importance of getting the 13th Amendment passed before the war ends, I feel like that, and if that is an idea that he was able to push forward was very important and significant. And so if you're going to teach the American public something accurate, I think that that was an important thing. Okay, although he does leave a lot of the other details out, which really is, is unfair you know, to the women's movement and, and another, a number of other groups right, at the same time. So any other questions? Do we all get to pick our favorite scene? Um, so we're not talking about Tony Kushner, though. Um, and Tony Kushner, so Spielberg, classic liberal, but Kushner is more of a leftist, an activist. Why, why does Kushner, or, or are you assuming that he's so influenced by Spielberg, or why does Kushner frame the story this way? Or could it be, okay, you have no idea? But, but I'm wondering, could it be that the point of this film is to show, in just this short period of time, what the machinations were to get the 13th Amendment passed. I mean, it's, it's not about Lincoln's growth, as interesting as that is. Douglas himself said that Lincoln's greatness was his capacity for growth. But that's not what this movie's about. This movie's about just a few days. It's about, it's about the political machinery in Washington. Right. It does that really well. Right. Right. And that's, that would be to answer the question about the favorite scene. It wouldn't be any one scene. It would be the little bits where it's showing that. You have to get it done. That was good, but you don't know why anybody cares. I, I would argue that we assume why in a lot of I mean, this is this is part of our lore. We do, sure, somebody from Mars doesn't know why we care, but I think most people have sort of the basics in, in mind with That's this it. story. Well, let me ask you a question, Steve. I mean, would you would you then take it a step further and and maybe argue that you know this is a Spielberg's commentary on what's going on in Washington now, yeah. you know, a sort of Congress at odds with the president, right, even though he's doing the right thing, he still can't get what he needs done without, you know, making promises and deals. I mean, that's probably, that's probably why Obama showed it in the White House, like, a, like multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I thought Obama was ready to be like Lincoln, by the way, so it is, and he hasn't turned out to be, he hasn't made the shift towards a more radical perspective at all. He's made, he's made a moderate, whereas Lincoln did make that shift, the thing that isn't portrayed in this film. So, I don't know whether it does relate to Obama. Well, but Lincoln could make that shift because half the country wasn't allowed to vote. So if half, if the South weren't allowed to vote, then Obama could do whatever he okay. wanted. Yeah, but well, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I just wanted to, everybody just laid the great groundwork for it. I wanted to say what I liked the best and what I liked the least about the film. Um, so as some of you just alluded, what I liked the best about the film is that he shows Lincoln making bold and unpopular moves as president to get through the gridlock in Congress. I thought that that was a very novel way of presenting Lincoln, actually even breaking some of the myths of um, Although he's not the president that wouldn't chop down the cherry tree, but he's just about as angelic. But I think it really did a good job showing that when it came to ethics, there are there are times where the end justifies the means, and I think that that is a, a fantastic um, 
lesson, actually, uh, although very complicated, maybe more complicated than the media is really picking up on, um, this question of under what circumstances do you uh, compromise your morality in order to get some higher good past. And in that way, the film echoes Schindler's List in, in, a more, in a positive way in some sense, although in Schindler's List, it's masked the extent to which Schindler is truly unethical. Um, he comes off looking better than he really is. Um, but I think um, two of the worst things about the film and why I think it's really problematic is that, like in Schindler's List, um, Spielberg falls into a trap that historians of the 19th century used to fall into. It's called the great man view of history. Um, I mean, I'm just really basically restating what uh, Professor Thomas said, but in a slightly different way. I mean, we just no longer believe in the great man view of history. One leader like Martin Luther King or Lincoln or George Washington is not responsible for democracy in this country and for the end of slavery and for the civil rights movement. We now know very well how many small leaders, leaders with little elves, there are at the local level. And to erase that from the story of Lincoln and to give us this very old-fashioned view of history, um, I mean, I, I think we could talk about why Spielberg, as somebody who might himself see Hollywood as sort of a great man place, um, might be tempted to fall into this trap. Thinking but, about himself. Yeah, <laughs> thinking about himself, right? That, that there is this one person who can move mountains, but actually there's a lot of people that have to be involved paving the way for these the changes to happen, like Frederick Douglass, like Elizabeth Cady, Sam, like all the feminists and the abolitionists. Um, well, and the irony know. that I, I wanted to get to in my, by quoting Lincoln is, Lincoln did not believe in the great man theory of history either. So and it's like Spielberg is like presenting him as a great man, and Lincoln's just like, no, I'm just doing, it's, it's, uh, it's, the, it's, you know, it's Uncle Tom's Cabin did this. Right, and actually that's the other thing I wanted to pull about cinematic language, because we haven't talked that much about the way the visual techniques that Spielberg uses to get this point across, but um, I'm going to borrow my first point from, again, from your blog, from Professor Thomas's blog, where he talks about the ways in which this film resembles Citizen Kane. And maybe you can talk a little bit more about it, but it's another one of these great man politician films. And it relies intensely on a technique called depth of focus, where there's some things happening in the front and other things happening in the back. Uh, two, so you can see two fields of vision at the same time. So I'm going to let Professor Thomas talk about it a little more. No, that's it, that's it. But that's I think it's it. not an accident that Spielberg adopts this technique. I think that this is a way in which uh, great men can seem even greater because they overshadow all the people around them, even within the mise-en-scene of the camera. Um, and then my least favorite scene, actually, is not that, but it's the, the, it's the scene with Thaddeus, Thaddeus Stevens and his mistress. Because it's one thing to portray um, African American women as absent, invisible, or apolitical, but it's another thing to put them in bed, right? <laughs> this is like, you could just go, the other movie that's been nominated that has a similar problem is the movie Pilot. I don't know if any of you saw it, but right before I walked into the theater, my partner said, I bet somewhere in this film there's going to be a gratuitous nudity scene. Um, and sure enough, you know, yes, there is, um, in that case, between a black man and a white woman. Um, I mean, this is something that, of course, Spielberg's not using nudity, but it's, it's just not the right place to have an intellectual conversation about abolition and politics. And it just changes the whole representation of empowerment that the end of slavery is supposed to represent, it completely subverts the whole meaning of the film. The whole film is supposed to be about empowering um, African American men and women, and instead it takes that away from them through scenes like that and some of the other ones the panelists mentioned. So I just, I mean, I, I think that Spielberg, you know, is, it's interesting that he tackles these big history questions he does bring them to big audiences, but if he doesn't get them to think about the topic critically, are we really better off? That's the question. So that's that's what I want to say. And I hope some of you will share some other thoughts about the visual elements of the film as well. All right. So I I I, I want to.
surprisingly, I want to come to defense of, of Steven Spielberg and address this notion of Daddy Stevens in bed with his, his common law wife, because that's what she was, right? Um, and I think what Spielberg is trying to do, and I don't agree that he is successful, but I think the idea is that he has had, Daddy Stevens has had such a long-term relationship with this woman that in fact he's so comfortable with her that he can talk to her about such an important topic in bed. But to look at that, that issue, right, of the kind of, you know, um, marginalized African American who the film is, is largely about, but they're invisible. I thought the scene that was rather interesting is where they bring them up to the balcony and they're just silent and they kind of walk in and they smile and they show, you know, the different looks on their face as they hear the different states voting yes or no for the amendment. And I thought that that was really interesting that he gave them absolutely no dialogue, right? No interaction with one another. They're just kind of puppets on a stage and wish to have the string pulled at whatever time they seem to be necessary. Uh, seem to be necessary. The other scene that I thought that was very interesting where African Americans uh, are central to the theme is that very opening scene where they're in that battle and African Americans are presented as savages, stepping on the face of Confederates, right? I mean, they're basically just killing them in the most kind of horrible and horrific ways. Um, and I thought that that was really interesting. In fact, slavery is a horrible institution. Why then wouldn't you, you know, show scenes that would bring that idea forward. And so Spielberg, for whatever reason, isn't able to do that. But again, I think... That was a Saving Private Ryan moment. Yeah, right. That's exactly right. <laughs> Talking about that class thing. Um, but, but I think what you have is this idea that, you know, Steven Spielberg feels that he is... he has been given this kind of God-given right to tell history. And for a lot of people who see this, this is about as much as they're going to know about the 13th Amendment. Right, and so when you really think about it, it becomes extremely dangerous because their history is Steven Spielberg's history, right? Um, somebody has a mic. Thanks. Um, th this is not a justification for the film, but I think that there's something inherent in popular cinema that's going, if it's going to deal with history, it's going to tell a great man's story maybe occasionally a great woman's story, but the audiences just can't get their minds around the complexity that we're talking about. They, but a, a single person whose actions to focus on, um, you know, that's, that's what we'll go and see. And I, I, you know, I don't have a solution. I can imagine other, other films that would be more complex and would just play in a few art theaters in uh, Manhattan. <laughs> yeah, there's a... Uh... Um, the example of a film, I think the best film that I've seen um, where there is no single character and his subplot love story, which is what usually happens in these things, but um, is The Battle of Algiers, and I can't remember the name of the director, it's an Italian director. Um, and Ponte Corvo. What? Ponte Corvo. Ponte Corvo. Um, and his movie does do that. I mean, it shows how the Algerians were able to effectively overthrow the French government, um, despite the fact that all their leaders were killed or imprisoned. Because um, it was basically women and children and their husbands and people, like all their husbands were being imprisoned, and just the just town did it. Um, and and I, when I, I remember showing that to my students in a class, and they liked it, but it took, they, it was strange for them because there was no single character to focus on. It was, it was a very strange experience, and they told me that. Um, it was just a completely different way of telling a story and writing a movie. And Ponte Corvo, after that movie, um, was not getting contracts to make more movies. So, um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, even though everybody thinks it's one of the best movies in cinema history, he was not, you know, making money like Spielberg does. Any other questions? So I'll ask.
ask a last question. This is a real question, not a statement. Um, so, I mean, first of all, I, I am interested if other people have least favorite scenes. I think that's always an interesting thing to talk about, um, including the students. Um, but also, overall, do you think it's better that, that Spielberg made this film, or that you wish that he hadn't made this film? That's a good question. So, I don't know, maybe, um, I don't know, one of the students wants to start? I mean, I think ultimately it's a good thing that he made the movie because it got the story out there. I mean, people don't know about the Thirteenth Amendment. Yeah, it's sure. you know, there's been several. I don't know the exact. There's been a fair number since then, and it's kind of like we know that it happened. We sort of know what it did, but we don't know how it got passed. And I think ultimately the limit, like what we're talking about, how there's not enough about the abolitionists, about the women, about the slaves themselves. He has two hours and 15 minutes, three hours maximum to make this movie. If you want to get all the nuances and the evolution of Lincoln as the man and showing Northern society and Southern society, then you need an HBO series. Or you need, a, or you need, or you need the Civil War by Ken Burns. I don't know, man. You're not going like, to be able to do all like that 20 hours. minutes on him and his son talking in the mud about nothing. I was like, we're going to cut that out. <laughs> I mean, there were some things that yeah. cut, but and I think... put put in like a black person for that like five minutes, you know. It's like you had twenty minutes of him talking to his son about absolutely nothing. Well, that's so I, did not that. <laughs> I did not need that. I did not need that. But I think ultimately, I mean, one thing that I really liked about the movie is that in it, the couple of minutes that showed the South, there's this one scene where the Southern negotiators are on a steamboat talking to Ulysses S. Grant, and they're debating the terms of surrender. And what they ultimately say is, we won't know ourselves after this. And I think that's something that you never hear in history is, this war, as great as it is, or as great as its effects were, as good as they were, it destroyed a way of life. Now, it's a way of life that we can all agree, I think, was based on a terrible thing. But still, it was a way of life that people were willing to fight for. And I think that when we talk about the Civil War, we neglect that part of it. And just because they were fighting to defend slavery, doesn't mean their story isn't worth being told. And I would love if he would make a sequel or another film looking at the Southern point of view, because I would think that's something that, it's a story that at least I would like to see to be told. Well, one of my students actually wrote a paper last semester about how a lot of South, a lot of Southerners were against slavery. So there's multiple Southern points of yeah. view. And I think that would, I think you're right. I think that would be a good film. Yeah. Did I answer the question? Oh, yes. Good or bad? <laughs> Which question do you want me to answer? <laughs> I mean, I thought it was a really good film, but yet again, like I said before, um, my main issue with it was the lack of black appearance because of what it's strictly about. So, I agree, it probably would have been better as an HBO series if you wanted everything in for it to be factual and things like that. But I thought it hit upon um, everything it needed to because there is there are people that don't know anything about the 13th Amendment or anything like that. Like, I went with a few of my friends and they had not a clue. And in the way there, in the car, I had to give them a little synopsis of what actually happened during that time. So when we got there, they understood the whole thing. But he cleared it up, I think, for them and other people in the audience that had no idea of the history behind it. So, so I, I had kind of mixed feelings about the film. Uh, as, as pure entertainment for the aesthetic beauty of, of the film, right, it's a filmmaker and storyteller, it was very entertaining. But as a historical film, I thought it was horrible. Because I think what Steven Spielberg lacked was the horror of the Civil War and how it divided the country and how, I mean, we really, in many ways, are still healing from the Civil War. So if before the Civil War, the South is the most economically prosperous section of the country, and after the Civil War, you know, in essence, the North colonizes the South in order for them to survive. Steven Spielberg just sort of says, well, it kind of happened, and it was two brothers who were fighting, and we had this really strong president who did what he had to do, and in the end, we kissed and made up. I really thought that in terms of historical context, he really missed the point of the Civil War. It, in fact, going to take on the abolition of slavery, you have a responsibility to tell that story and tell it accurately and tell it forcefully. I mean, I can't imagine if, in fact, he did Schindler's List and he made the Nazis, you know, like the Hogan's heroes. 
you know, where they're like, you know, dopey, silly, right, clowns who are being undermined and they have no idea. I mean, you can't, you couldn't do that, right? No one would accept that. And yet, when we tell a history of the Civil War and the kind of horrors associated with it, we have to try to smooth it over um, to make the South look um, like the wounded party as opposed to the aggressor um, in such a horrible effect. So yeah, I think that he really does. It's a really great opportunity to tell and do a really great story about the Civil War, which is still so vivid in the imagination of Americans, and yet he doesn't hesitate it, does not take that. Instead, I think I agree with uh, Floyd Weintraub that it does tells the story of a great man as opposed to the story of a great nation. Um, uh, just thinking about if, if it was uh, to be like an HBO series, I don't think you can capture, I think there's, you can't remember an HBO series or, or a seven part series as an epic. And this, this was in, in some kind of way an epic movie. And also, having studied uh, Spielberg and his work, I, I know that I'm not walking into Birth of a Nation 2. I know that, <laughs> that the story isn't going to be depicted, isn't going to be depicted that way. Uh, and then that's just by just by knowing the way he tells a film. Um, I, I, I'm fine as an audience member buying into the great man theory. I, 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 I'll buy into it for, for a long time, I think. Uh, but one of my favorite scenes, and it's actually a misleading scene, is is um, the opening war scene. And everybody knows Saving Private if, you, if you've seen Saving Private Ryan, the most epic part of the movie is the first nine minutes. That's the minutes. only part. Yeah, it's, 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 it's just, he, he can, he can, he can direct uh, war, war reenactments incredibly. And it, this is only a short scene. It's only maybe 30, 40 seconds long, if, if that even. And as an audience member, we, we want to see, we want to see war. We want to see if this is about the guy, about the Civil War. We want to see it. And he doesn't, he doesn't really show more of that uh, towards later on. And the only reason why I enjoy it is because of the way he can direct those scenes. And he does it in War Horse, and he does it in, in, other, in other movies. And um, I don't think his, he is making an, another movie. I don't think it's a sequel, because it's called Robo Apocalypse. So I, I don't think that he's going to be making a sequel to make it anytime soon. Well, and I, th I think you're absolutely right that, like, especially in the middle of the movie, since he keeps talking about the war dragging on, like that's the character, that's the whole, like, that's the drive of the film. Like, you're like, is he gonna pass it in time to stop the war, you know, that's, that's how the kind of plot works. Um, so he manipulates the actual chronological, t historical time in order to kind of give you this cinematic time. Um, and he could have very, that would have been a good moment to like, okay, I'm talking about how bad the war is, now I'll show you. Um, and he doesn't do it. Um, and, yeah. Um, so the question is, should, should, we have, should he have made the movie or not? Is it better, are we better off? Um, I would say that we are in this room because we're talking about it. Um, so I think, you know, I, I, I'm kind of a, old school, you know, the reader matters as much as the, the text, and like a community of people like this, when you, have a, when you have a community of people like this who are getting around and talking about it, that's, that's what impresses me much more than the film. So like I think we could have had a, a somewhat dorky film that had a really good conversation. We had a pretty good film. Could have been a much better film. I think aesthetic. I, don't, I disagree with you guys on the aesthetics. I think the aesthetics are. He's made better movies, um, and I won't go into the deep focus shot thing, but um, that's part of it. So, would you like Jurassic Park? No, I'm thinking, I'm thinking like yeah, I'm thinking like I'm that joking. stuff. <laughs> um, I think it could have been a more aesthetically pleasing movie and more inclusive, even within two two hours. It could have been shorter and still included more. Um, included more. So I guess I'm sidestepping side the question of whether I think it's, we're better off for him having made it. I think my answer would be we're better off for us coming together and talking about it critically. Um, that's how I would put it.
Well, I would like to thank everyone for coming. This has been very enlightening. Um, I guess what I, what I would encourage everyone to do is keep the conversation going. Um, I'm sure that there are people who don't get the benefit of sort of sitting down and thinking about it aesthetically and literally and as historical um, drama. Um, but if you have the opportunity in which to speak and talk about it, I think that you know, to bring it into a focus right, that talks a little bit more about the, the accuracies of the event as opposed to what Steven Spielberg has presented to us, I think that that in and of itself I agree with Steve, provides the best opportunity to educate ourselves in those accounts.